What's the relationship between poets and theaters and actors and democracy? Make, well, make that link. Yeah, I think, I think we have to give words and names to our feelings. And we have to be able to talk about our plight. So we've just been talking about Hamlet. You know, the question of what do I do when the truth is hidden? How do I live with myself when I'm a mystery? How do I live in community with others when I don't even understand myself? Those are basic. And you can't legislate answers to those questions. You need poetry, history, the humanities. These are the fields that inform us about how we got here. And so when I think about the way this collection arrived and then what our, our hopes and plans are for it, so these are some of the 82 first folios sitting there beautifully in a case. Each one has a story to tell. But the collection is much broader. So you can see this uh, production note from Paul Robeson's product, uh, performance in Othello in 1930, which took place in London because he couldn't perform on the segregated stages of the United States. We have the prompt book that shows exactly what lines were spoken and cut in that production, and we could mount it again. Oh, really? And if you look over there, there's a, an interesting uh, squiggle. That's actually King Henry VIII when he was a schoolchild. He was reading his own copy of Cicero, and he decided to write, and these are big, bold letters, he is a king, this book is mine, Prince Henry. <laughs> uh, but it's interesting, I think, to actually have the documents, which will not just tell the story of the people who made them, but can tell us more. And I just thought I'd show you this slide because we can learn a lot from books. This is something from a project that we did called Project Dust Bunny. And we got really interested in the dust in books that are 400 years old because when people use books, they lean over them and they drop hair and skin cells in the gutters of those books. And usually when we conserve or treat a book to try to keep it stable, we find the dust and we throw it away. So at one point we decided instead to run a Q-tip up and down the book and send it to a lab. And what we discovered is that we could successfully sequence the mitochondrial DNA of the human beings who used that book. Which means that it is now theoretically possible that if we found Shakespeare's DNA, Francis Bacon's DNA in a book, Queen Elizabeth's DNA in a book, there would be a way to prove that it was or wasn't that person. And so, I, I, you know, I love the fact that the objects continue to speak in languages now that we, I mean, I don't know the, the four, the, the sequences of amino acids that make up the huge sonnet that is the human genome, but I think it's really interesting that we have that. And so, you know, our goal as we look ahead would be to open all of that up to, to people who come to Washington. 23 million people a year are coming. They should come and ask some of those questions of themselves. They should see some of these sources. They should look at the 82 first folios and ask themselves, where is my story? You know, how does Othello speak to me? How does Hamlet draw out all of these feelings that I have? Because I got to understand those too.